God's good. Amen. There are major elements to serving God. Major elements to serving God. And I want to mention a few of them here before I give you my title. Amen. Major elements to serving God. One is faithfulness. Everybody say faithfulness. Amen. He, he's going to say to those that are faithful, that make it, and you can't afford to hear anything else. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He didn't say pastor. He didn't say teacher. He didn't say evangelist. He didn't say good looking dude. He didn't say babe. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. So that has nothing to do with all the other elements. Faithfulness is a very important element in the kingdom of God. we got to be faithful. Another important element in the kingdom of God is respect. The Bible said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so we need to respect the things of God and hold up the kingdom of God in high degree. Amen. And the people of God are the kingdom. Amen. This church is the bride of Christ, and so you need to have respect. Amen. Respect to each other. And uh, hold each other up in prayer and hold each other up. Amen. And if you see somebody's flaws and faults, just the Lord said, before you try to get the splinter out of your neighbor's eye, get the telephone pole out of yours. Amen. So, um, yeah. Respect. The things of God, the kingdom of God. The next element is love. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love, the love of God, never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. <clears throat> love suffers long and is kind. Envieth not, vaunteth not down itself, is not puffed up, not behaves itself unseemingly, seeketh not its own, is not easily provoked, taketh the evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, love never fails. He said, I want you to love one another. First commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. So we need to love God. And we need to love each other. We need to love others. And we need to love ourselves. Some people don't love themselves enough to keep themselves out of trouble. Some people don't love themselves enough to take care of their own body and their own health. And and they don't love themselves enough to hate sin. They they got themselves in trouble and they're headed to an eternity without God. So you need to love yourself. You really can't love other people if you don't love yourself. And so love God, love others. These are elements, important elements of serving God. Another important element is... Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Everybody say, faint not. not. Don't faint. If you have a reward to collect, then hang in there, because if you faint not. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Amen. The devil would like to knock you out. The world says we got lots of stuff for you. But don't faint. Amen. Don't faint. These are important elements. There's a bunch more. But the one I want to talk about tonight is the spirit of gratefulness. We need to be grateful or thankful. This is not just Thanksgiving. This is a very important part. I'm going to give you an illustration in a minute about this being the trigger of all the other elements. This is the important one. If you have this one, then you can have love. If you have this one, you can be faithful. If you have this one, you won't faint. So this is one of the most important elements of all of the things about serving God, and that is being grateful being thankful. So now we're going to read our scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 15, just a couple of brief scriptures to let you hear the word of God on the subject. 
Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. <clears throat> That's not it, is it? Wow. <laughs> That's my bad. Let's go ahead to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks. Does that sound like it? <laughs> In everything give thanks. To this is the well, the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Everybody say concerning you. Concerning you. Amen. This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to give thanks. Of course, it says in, in the Psalms, in order to escape with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Amen. I want to preach about the spirit of gratefulness here tonight. Let's thank the Lord. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for every heart and life. We thank you for your hand in our lives. We ask your Blessings upon it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The sons of Korah were the ones that <clears throat> made up the choir back in the Old Testament. And they had a choir. And so in the choir, of course, you sing praises and you give God glory for what he has done. And the sons of Korah were chosen. The reason they were chosen is because of their attitude. They had a, an amazing attitude of thankfulness and gratefulness just to be there. Just to be there. That's more pleasing to God than, than perfectly sounding voices or perfectly dressed people. Is the attitude of being thankful. Just glad to be here. See, Korah rose up against Moses with 250 princes, which were leaders of the land. God forbid that leaders would rise up against authority and, and cause dissension. But Korah rose up with his leaders, and there was 251 of them. And uh, they came to Moses and said, we don't like the way you do business. You kind of have the attitude that you, you know God better than we do. And so we're coming against you. And Moses was the meekest man except for Jesus Christ. So Moses said, okay, let me go talk to the Lord and let's see what he has to say. And so when he came back, he said, the Lord told me to tell you to go stand right over there on that side of the hill and the mountain. So they all marched over there and the Lord swallowed them up in fire and brimstone. Korah and his princes. The sons of Korah were standing on the edge of the cliff, and they saw the destruction, but they didn't go. And they were just left, their clothes smelling like smoke, and they had a first-hand seat to see what God had to think about rebellion and coming against his man and him. And so their attitude was just glad to be here. We almost didn't make it. We almost were destroyed with other people, but we're, we're spared somehow. We're just glad to be here. And the Lord wanted to have that kind of an attitude with the voice behind it for people to sing praises to God because he's not just looking for the sound, but he's looking for something that goes on in your heart when you praise God. You don't want to ever take this for granted. We are so blessed to serve God. We are so blessed to be here. None of us, no, how, no matter how long we've been here, can take it for granted or become desensitized in the fact that, that I'm just glad to be in the house of the Lord. It's a privilege to be in church tonight. It's a privilege to be in church tonight. There's no conditions to it for people that have that kind of an attitude. It doesn't matter what's going on. They're just glad. To be praising God. A trigger, usually we think of it on a gun. And there's all kinds of parts to the gun. There's the stock, which is the handle that, 
that you put up against your arm or shoulder. There's the barrel. There's the mechanism that triggers the, the bullet. But then there's down there, right up there where your finger is, there's called the trigger. And so I want to tell you tonight that thankfulness and gratefulness is the trigger to all of these other elements. To loving God, to being faithful, to not feigning, to all of the things that we mentioned before, they have to have this trigger. Because none of them are any good. That's what 1 Corinthians is talking about. If, if, I, if I do a lot of great things, but I don't have love, then it's nothing. It's nothing. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love and become a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love is important. But you could do a lot of good things and not really have it in your heart. And so the trigger of having real love is I'm just glad to be here. I want to be thankful. I don't want to take it for granted that, that the Lord did great things for us. And so it's important to understand that this is the element that's the trigger. This actually triggers the other elements that are important. we got to be faithful. But you're not going to be faithful if you're not thankful. You're not going to love if you're not thankful. You're going to have all kinds of other issues if this one element doesn't get put first and, and foremost, how do people backslide serving God? I mean, it's kind of an oxymoron, but it really is true. Some people right in the middle of serving God backslide. They lose their love. In fact, the Lord said, I want you to turn back to your first love. Something happened. You, you let something slip. And so I want you to go back to the, the first works. What's it about? Well, when you first come in church, you're just in love with God. You're in love with everybody you see. You're in love with the church, the atmosphere, the presence of God. You're just thrilled to be here. You just came from a world of sin, and, and the devil is no friend to you, and habits and sins are, are destroying you, and you live with fear, and you're in trouble on every side. You come to church and God sets you free. He delivers you. He changes you. He lets you sleep at night. He, he loves you. And you begin to realize, I am just so thrilled just to be here. Yeah. To be in the kingdom of God. To have <clears throat> the promise of eternity is, is so thrilling. And <clears throat> Israel was delivered. This, this whole story of Israel is, is the same thing that we go through. Acts 2.38 is repentance, baptism, and Holy Ghost. So repentance is turning from sin, and in Egypt is a type of sin. So they had to repent of Egypt. And God delivered them out of sin, and here they are in the wilderness, and now they're going to go through the sea. And they're standing before the sea, and now they're starting to murmur and complain. You brought us all the way out here, and we hear Pharaoh behind us, and there's horses. And the next thing you know, we're going to be back in slavery, and it's going to be extra heavy on us because we tried to escape. That was what the murmurs and complainers, and, and Moses said, stand still and see the glory of God. And God told him, take your staff and put it in the water, and the water parted. And if you wanted to see that, you could go to over here. They made a replicate of it. And the water parted and they walked through on, the Bible says, dry ground. It was a miracle. But God set them free. They went through, they came out of Egypt, they went through the baptism, and then they were going to go to Canaan land, the promised land. But in the wilderness, they sort of kind of took for granted all the great things that God had done and was doing. They got hungry and he gave them manna. Their shoes, they just didn't have any shoe stores around. And so the Lord just made their shoes last for 40 years. Anybody have 40-year-old shoes here? Their shoes lasted for 40 years because God was good to them, but they got to murmuring and complaining. They got to looking at the world. They got to wanting to serve other gods. I mean, how in the world can people backslide serving God? Well, they know they love God, and they say they love God, and they want to be faithful, and they want to do it, and they go through the motions, but... But it's not in their heart. They're not really feeling it. What's the trigger? The trigger is, I need to be thankful. I need to think about the goodness of God. The whole Old Testament was about constantly having ceremonies. 
and constantly having feasts and parties. And what was it about? It wasn't just to feed your face, but it was to help you remember what God has done. So every year there's a Passover about how they got delivered from Egypt. Then every year, then 50 days later, is called the Feast of Pentecost. And what is it? It's just going over again. Don't forget, God has delivered us. God has set us free. And so we are so blessed just to be here. That element is very important. And so throughout the whole Old Testament, I mean, when, when David was bringing the ark home, they, uh, Brother Oggs, one of our preachers, figured out how many gallons of blood was, was shed. Because they, wa- they would walk six, spe- uh, six steps and then six paces. And then they would, have, they would stop, they would set up shop, and they would have a sacrifice. And, of course, the sacrifice starts with killing the animal, and they got to bleed the blood out of it. And so gallons of blood, six more paces. They went miles and miles, six paces at a time. And what was the, the point? The point was don't forget that this is the presence of God. Don't forget that your God is the real God. Don't forget what God has done for us. Don't forget what God has done for you. Constantly reminded. Every time they came to the tabernacle, there was an altar. They had to make a sacrifice. We heard about that this morning. Then they went to the labor. They had the holy place and the holy of holies. And all of it was a constant reminder of something they didn't even realize yet. But that's a constant reminder ahead of time that the the Savior of the world's coming someday. And he's going to be the supreme sacrifice. And you need to be reminded that if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here. Thank God we were spared. Thank God we are not cast into hell like all the angels that fell. There's no plan of redemption for them. Thank God he went to Calvary so that if you would like to, you could be saved. If you would like to, you could go to heaven. If you would like to, you could have a mansion. If you would like to, you could have eternal life. If you would like to, you could be 35 again. Or whatever it is. I would like to. We got to remember celebrations and, and feasts. And the answer is you got to be thankful. You got to think about the contrast. And what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that a lot of things happen in life and get us caught up in trying to accomplish things and trying to do things and trying to go after things. And before you know it, we're, we're, we're forgetting what God has done. Before you know it, it's something this, that, or the other. There's a bunch of things that happen in life, and it takes away our thankfulness. Don't let anything cheat you out of your praise. Because praising God is not just singing. It's not just testifying. But it's, it's, it's the spirit of praise in your heart. The difference in in the, the motions, the difference in going through the ritual, the, the word we use is religion. Because religion is man's attempt to do it. So we go through the motions. It could happen right here in this church. You could backslide right on the bench. Because when you pray, you're not really touching God. You're going through the motions. Your flesh and your mind is saying, we got to hurry up and get over with because we got other things we got to do. So I'm just trying to go through the motions. You, you can't do that. You got to have it in your heart. It's got to be the spirit of thanksgiving. It can't just be, well, I said thank you, so isn't that good enough? No, it's not just a thank you. It's a lifetime of thankfulness. It's every day you get up and you say, thank you, God, for this day. Every day you get up, you say, thank you, God, for Calvary. Every time you have communion, you remember that God's been good to me. And so it's important that we remember some of the things that God has done. I tell people to, to make a log or, or have, a, have some kind of a, a notebook where you write all the good things God has done because God's been so good to us. I mean, in my own life, when I was young, just one year old, I just about lost my hands. And you think of what life would be without your hands. And I've done so many things with my hands. And, and it's just such a pleasure to be able to reach or do or whatever. And it just comes natural. And I need to thank God that I have my hands. 
I've been injured a few times, and recently my, my knee was injured, and I was in a wheelchair, and I'm sitting there thinking, I may never walk again, and what will it be like, and how will it be, and, and I'm just, you know, I finally gave it up and said, okay, fine, I'm going to be here, but in the meantime, I have a lot of other things to be thankful for. That thought didn't come out of my own heart. That thought came from the Lord. If you lose your knee, fine. You still got another one. You can't actually stand on one leg. You actually do have the Lord. You have the church. You have friends. You have the rest of the organs in your body. Your mind is still working. You can still talk. You can still preach. And so I started thanking God for what all I did have. Then the Lord said, I'm going to heal you. And so he did. And so I now can do everything as if nothing happened. And so I don't want to forget the goodness of God. I don't want to take it for granted. I want to, I want to remember what God has done. He's been good. Remember what the load of sin was like. Remember how light you feel when you're not having to worry and stress and, and think about all the stuff that could happen as a result of what you did wrong. But God has put it under the blood. And now all you're supposed to do is praise him with your thankful spirit. Not just a thankful mouth. Not just a thankful gesture. But actually down inside your soul, you really are thankful. Lord, I just want to thank you. David was thankful. He constantly said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And, and praise God. And his whole psalms were about praising God. There must have been some deep feeling inside of David about how thankful he was. He loved the Lord and he was was thankful. We need to be thankful. And then we could think about what it would be if it wasn't for what God did. I mean, I hate to think of it. The devil and all the fallen angels are, are literally angry, raging beings because they have no... Hope. There's no redemption plan for them. So they're, they're just out to get you in their category so that you can be lost too. They just have a spirit of, of anger and vengeance. You'll see it out there somewhere. There'll be an expression that they get to give that's about as close as they can get to you. Is to, to show some road rage somewhere or something because they don't like what you're doing. You're serving God. You're going through more than just emotions. You have an attitude of thankfulness throughout your life. So you wake up, you praise God, you come to church. It's not just, I mean, this church couldn't have the presence of God if it was just a religious institution going through the motions. There's people in this church that are pouring out their heart in praise to God as we sing. And the presence of God comes down because he inhabits the praise of his people. He didn't say he inhabits the best singers. He didn't say he inhabits the best players. He said he inhabits the praise of his people. When the, when the sons of Korah begin to sing and praise God, they're not thinking about who's looking at me or how does this sound or will I get a girlfriend or a boyfriend from this? What will happen in my life because of what I'm doing? It's not about them. They're saying we're just glad to be alive because we almost didn't make it. So when you think about what it could be right now, what it would have been, and none of us, including me, can never stand and say, well, I've done great things. No. Where would I be if it wasn't for the grace of God? Where would I be if it wasn't for the mercy of God? Every day of my life, I have a prayer. And I've got to make this prayer for real. Because I can't think of anything better to say than the prayer that I have. So I know it by heart. But I can't just go through the motions of it. I need to mean it from my heart when I say it. And I start my prayer every day and thank you, Lord, for your love. And think about it. If God didn't love you in his almighty power, ability, if he didn't love you, I mean, he could do you some pretty bad harm. If he didn't want you to live, you couldn't have one more heartbeat. If he didn't want you to live, your brain wouldn't have more, one more brain wave. If he was against you, I mean, you're done. He doesn't have to chase you around the bush three times to catch you. If he wants you out, you're done right now. But he doesn't. He loves you. He wants, he he says, I'm going to look past your failures. He said, love covers a multitude of sin. 
God loves us so much that he went to Calvary to cover all of our sins. We don't deserve to be forgiven. But because his love is toward us, I thank God for his love every day. And I want to think about those things when I say that statement. I want it to come from my heart. Being human, it doesn't always. Because I say it, because I know it. And then I think to myself, I need to go back and visit that and mean what I'm saying. Because thank you, Lord, for your love. I mean, where would we be if it wasn't for the love of God? We sang a song just earlier, because he loves me. I want to serve him because he loves me. That's kind of selfish, but it is true. God loves us so much. I thank him for his love. I thank him for his mercy. He didn't give me what I deserved. He had mercy on me. I thank him for his kindness. I thank him for his goodness. I thank him for his grace. He gives me power to find myself doing the right thing. When the devil would like to tempt me to do something else. When the world would have me doing some other, chasing some other thing. The Lord has given me grace to be doing the right thing. I can't take the credit for having served him or being faithful or done all of these things. It all is wrapped up in I need to be thankful that God has helped me to make it this far. I can't take the credit. If I'm thankful, then I thank him for the grace that has kept me. Any one of us could be wiped out in a moment through our own carnality and our own failures if we're not careful. And if you fail, don't give up. Get up and thank God for his mercy and his grace. You can't go wrong when you thank God. When that thankfulness is... From your heart, it's your spirit of thanksgiving. It's one thing to say, I'm sorry. And so Peter said, man, I'm spiritual today, and I could do it seven times. I mean, I am really up there. And the Lord said, "Mm, not really. Not really. How about, I mean, we're not talking about a lifetime. That would be a lot. But he said, how about seven times 70 in a day, 490 times you're going to forgive. It's a spirit of forgiveness. It's ongoing. It's not something you say, okay, I've done this and now I'm done with it. And if you do it one more time, I'm done. There is no such thing as ever being done. When it comes to forgiveness, you got to grit your teeth and do it because you need it. And so you give it. And God gritted his teeth. And he took the cup of sin. The preacher this morning preached about Calvary. And how that the Lord didn't want to have to suffer and die. He didn't want to have to take on the the, the burden of being beaten and and all that happened. But I think more than all of that. When the, the God of glory took on a body. Who was pure and holy and never been defiled. Had to drink the cup of sin. Of all the things that happened. That cup represented something that God hated. And he drank the cup of sin so that you and I could be saved. He took on our sins to become the sacrifice. He became the sacrifice for our sins. So for him to take the cup of all the vile and filthy things in the world, he took it on. That's what he didn't want to do. He, he didn't say, let the beating pass from me. He didn't say, let the flogging, let the, <clears throat> let the, the crown pass. Let, he, did, he said, let this cup pass. <laughs> I don't want to drink this cup. This, this, this is things that I've never done. This is things I've never thought. This is things I would never want to do. He is God. He is holy. He is pure. And he, yet he said, nevertheless, not my will. Because there's, there's a victory in this. When I drink this cup. People's sins are going to be washed away. My blood is actually going to put it to where it it didn't happen. So what are we supposed to do? We need to thank God for that. When we sing thank God for the blood, it's not just the beat. It's not just who's singing or who's playing it. It needs to come right out of the depth of our soul. Thank God for the blood. Where would I be if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus? We sing those songs. They touch our hearts. And 
And if you're spiritual at all, if you're not just going through the motions, there's something down in that song that, that strikes a chord inside of you that touches heaven because heaven is thrilled when you have the spirit of gratefulness. Just glad to be serving God. Nothing should be able to take away your praise. Not even your own shame. Not even your own motives. Get rid of the wrong motives. Because selfishness will have you saying, you know, well, I came with, to God with a lot to offer. And so what, what's in it for me? That's a turn off to God. God can't bless that. God can't hardly stomach it. He probably gets the clothespins out right there. He says, I need to, I need to cut this smell off because this stinks. Don't let any wrong motive be in your heart. Don't let it replace your thankfulness. Because selfishness leads to envy and strife and jealousy. And jealousy is cruel. And by the time your motives take place, then you don't have thankfulness anymore. You're not thankful when you're looking at what somebody else has and saying, it's not fair that they have that and I want that. You're not thankful when you think about other people and, and, and their place or whatever it is, you, you know, you, when you're just glad to be here. If you're the ugliest person in the building, whoever you are, don't raise your hand. It, it, it'd be neat to say, you know what, I don't care if I'm good looking or not. I'm just glad to be in the house of God. I'd rather be the ugliest person in church than the most pretty person in the world. <laughs> because out there in the world, they're lost. But in church, no matter what you look like, you're a child of God. God is forgiving you. Thank God. My motives aren't going to affect my thankfulness. My circumstances. Circumstances are going to come. Storms are going to rage. There's going to be things come your way. And so don't ever, ever charge God foolishly. Thank God. He said in everything give thanks. You're giving thanks to the one that has the answer. You're giving thanks to the one that can change it. Jesus was in the grave three days. I don't really know what it means, but he was dead. But Lazarus was dead four days. And so they especially made the point. There's no use opening up this grave because he's already been dead four days and he stinks. And, and, and we don't understand why you're so late. You ever had anybody complain about you being late? And you were supposed to be there to do it? But yet you have the answer. And if you didn't arrive, there wouldn't be an answer. And so late or not, this man's voice is creative. So if he says Lazarus is not dead, guess what? You better move the stone. Because he is the creator. And if he makes a statement, then you need to act upon his statement. He said my sins are washed away. I believe it and thank God for it. He said I am a healer. I am a deliverer. I'm your attorney. I'm your great physician. I am everything. I don't want to argue about him being late. I don't want to argue about him, about the decisions that he makes. I just want to thank God. In everything, give thanks. Something went wrong. Thank the Lord. Because who knows what the plan of God is, but he, he, he never has any ill against us. He means good to all of us always. And so... Thank you, Jesus. Circumstances do not own my attitude of thanksgiving. Whatever happens, I'm still going to praise God. Yes, and we have done it. And it's a privilege to do it. And you know what? Thank God for the grace. Thank God for the grace. He gives you grace to do that when your circumstances look terrible. Conflicts. Don't ever let a conflict in this church knock you out of serving God. Paul said, I've been in perils of my countrymen. He was a Roman citizen, so probably. But he also said, I've been in perils of my brethren. And those are all of the household of faith. But not everybody in there is always... On the upside, not everybody in there has got the victory. And some people didn't like him or who he was or what he said 
or how he approached it. And so he said, I've been in perils of my brethren. He said, offense will come. Offense. Offense. In other words, something's going to happen that you don't like. And it's going to be in church. And it's going to be somebody that you didn't think should have had that attitude or done that or said that. But the bottom line is what you need to do is make up your mind that my spirit is thanksgiving. And so their problem is their problem. I don't want their problem to become a my, part of my problem. But I can't let circumstances determine, determine my spirit of thanksgiving. I can't let any conflict. Yeah, a conflict's a conflict. You can't ignore it. You can't just put your head in the sand and forget it. Something happened and it didn't go good. And, and it left you hurt. It left you wounded. And all of us have been offended. But, but don't hang on to it. You got to bury it. You got to find a place. You got to find a graveyard for an offense. You, you keep talking about it, and it's going to get bigger. And so you got to find a place where you're going to have peace. You're just going to, you're going to put it six feet under because every time you bring it up, it stinks. So bury it. And every time you revisit it, it's going to feel the same. You're going to go over the same thing. They said this. They did this. This is what happened. It wasn't right. And 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 and. It's cheating you out of being thankful. Paul said, I thank God for tribulation. I thank God that I can go through all the stuff I've been through. And that, and that was when he was making the list. I've been in perils of my brethren. I've been in perils of my countrymen. I've been a day and a night in the, in the deep. I've been boiled in oil. I've been fed to the lions. I've been through all these things. And I count it all joy. I'm happy. I'm just glad to be here. We're talking about Paul. Paul didn't deserve to be in the kingdom of God. Paul was a mass murderer. Paul didn't deserve to be serving God and to be an oracle for God. Nobody could, could qualify him. If he was in America today trying to be something, they would shoot him down in a second. But, but he's just saying, you know what? <clears throat> Whatever I have to go through, I'm okay. I'm just glad to be in the house of God. I'm just glad. Peter said, I, I don't even deserve to be crucified like him. <clears throat> Crucify me upside down if that's what's going to happen because I'm just glad to be here. They turned the world upside down with the spirit of thanksgiving. Yes, they were faithful. But you can't be faithful if you're not thankful. And then the last thing I want to mention in that list is expectations. Be careful what you get yourself thinking you're going to be or do or have or whatever. Because it will cheat you out of being thankful. Just look back at what God's done for you. Count your blessings. And then look forward of how it would have been if it wasn't for the Lord. And then just thank him with all your heart. A song that we sing and our singers can come. It's a beautiful song written by Joy Elms. I'm blessed with so many things. God's been good to me. I have family and friends who share in all that I do. But if I lose it all, and I'm left with nothing, if I have the Lord, I've lost things in life that I realize all the time I still have the Lord. My pastor's wife, Sister Urshan, used to sing that song years ago and I was probably 20 years old when I met her at conference and I said Sister Urshan I've never lost anybody close but if I ever do I want you to come to the funeral and I want you to sing that song because that song is so touching to my heart it says take everything but my Lord take my possessions Take my dearest love relations. Take the flowers, the sunshine, the rain. Take my ambition. Take my dreams. Take, take it all. But don't take Jesus. Well, he took Sister Urshan before he took Sister Cooperly, so she didn't get to sing that song, but it's still in my heart. I'm thinking a lot of times throughout life and circumstances when... You might feel like complaining. 
I thank God that I still have the Lord. You're not going to lose the Lord. He's faithful. The song says he's been faithful. He has never failed. My mom always says, God's been so good, I can't complain. So now we're going to stand and sing this song together. And I want you to just try to muster up the most powerful praise that you could have. From your heart. From the depth of your soul. To be thankful to God for his goodness. Not going through the motions. Not some ritual to say we got to get this over with. But heartfelt. I've already felt it in this service. I've already watched you praise God like this. I've watched the presence of God sweep across the audience tonight. And I'm thinking, boy, that's so neat. Because that's just what I'm preaching about. I'm not trying to raise the dead here of a bunch of people who are backslid and not interested. I, I'm just preaching to you how wonderful it is that we get to praise God. Heaven is touched when we praise God. Heaven is touched when nobody's listening, but you are by yourself and you're praising God. If you don't have the mic, still sing because they're listening up there. Their heart is touched up there. The people with the mic might not really be praising God. It's a dangerous spot to be up here when people are looking and, and, and who knows what's going on. But if nobody's listening and you're just there by yourself, don't mark it off. Because we're not singing for somebody to hear us. The Lord is listening. And our job, our calling is to praise God with a heart of thanksgiving. Let's do that right now. Kind of move toward the altar. We had an awesome message about the altar today. And so, yeah, the altar's a good place to be. But we're going to sing this song right now. I want you to sing it. Everybody else. 